Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So welcome to the new lecture again for dielectric uh, materials, uh, fundamentals and applications of dielectric ceramics. So let us just briefly recap the last lecture. So in the last lecture we basically talked about the uh, frequency dependent variation of 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 dielectric constant at low frequencies okay so we looked at essentially uh, how the dielectric constant varies at lower frequencies so it goes from a static to so basically we looked at epsilon rs epsilon r infinity and the difference between the two is the one that you observe at the lower frequencies and then we also looked at the variation of tan delta so this is low so this dipolar contribution is not resonance type of contribution rather it's a relaxation kind of behavior so that is what we looked at and then there is also a temperature dependence as a result since it is a temp since it is a relaxation kind of phenomena it is more like diffusive Arrhenius kind of behavior there is a Arrhenius kind of relationship though so as the temperature changes the change in the uh, tan delta peak it shifts to higher frequencies as you temperature changes so this is tan delta this is omega and the peak will ch shift to so right as your temperature increases so basically it requires lesser time for dipoles to uh, respond and dipoles become weaker as, as you increase the temperature. And then we looked at the phenomena of impedance spectroscopy because to, to, us, to analyze the dielectric materials is, it is often useful to model it in a circuit form. So we looked at one circuit for example the device circuit through which you represent a dielectric as a resistor and a capacitor in series and then you have uh, so this is R2 C2 and then you have C1 this sorry I mean you can say R1 and that is that is entirely up to you uh, okay let me just draw it little so this is okay yeah so this is okay for what I did was it was R1 C1 and C2 okay. But it does not matter, I mean R1, C1 and C2 are in entirely dependent upon your choice. But what basically it means is that you will have for a perfect dielectric, when you plot epsilon r double prime as a function of epsilon r prime, you should obtain a perfect semicircle, okay. It does not look like a perfect semicircle, maybe uh, something like this, okay. So this is perfect semi circle right and uh, as we saw that the peak peak of this is at omega tau is equal to 1 and from this uh, you can determine various characteristics. Uh, um, so we looked at for instance, so this was actually R2 C2 C1 in the context of this. So it is essentially what we will have is, so the frequency is increasing in this direction. So this contribution is your uh, high frequency uh, sorry low frequency contribution and this frequency is this is your high frequency contribution. So this is basically your epsilon r infinity and this will be epsilon r s minus epsilon r infinity okay. So uh, sorry epsilon r s just one second let me see. So yeah, so this will be epsilon s, epsilon r s minus epsilon r infinity. So that is what your uh, contributions will be. So you basically what will happen is that if you work out C1 and C2, your C1 will be epsilon r infinity and C2 will be epsilon r s minus epsilon r infinity divided by uh, C0, okay. So if you look at the contributions here this will be uh, epsilon r infinity this is basically c1 corresponding to c1 and this will be corresponding to so this is epsilon rs this will correspond to c1 plus c2 basically okay 
So, this is what you should obtain perfect semicircle and you can draw you can draw a right angle triangle anywhere in this semicircle and you should get a equation of semicircle. Using this uh, now this can also be modeled in the form of impedances because we know that impedance uh, impedance is related to admittance, admittance is related to your dielectric constant. So, this can be modeled in the form of impedances as well and we saw that uh, when you measure impedance from an impedance analyzer basically you are me you are measuring z theta ok. So, real part of uh, impedance will be z mod z cos theta and then you will have mod z uh, sin theta ok. So, you can determine what are the real parts of impedances, what are the imaginary parts of impedances and they will allow you to so, and we know that impedance is nothing but z star is equal to z prime minus i z double prime and z prime can be modeled as r divided by 1 plus omega r c square which is nothing but omega square tau square and z double prime can be omega r square c divided by 1 plus omega r c square which is nothing but omega r into tau divided by 1 plus omega square tau square. So, essentially it is nothing but r into omega tau plus 1 over omega square uh, tau square and so this is basically the variation of. So, you can see that there is a frequency dependence of impedance on the so, frequency we saw earlier. So, this impedances can be worked out as we know that y was the admittance, admittance was worked out as tau square omega square tau 2 c 2 divided by 1 plus omega square tau 2 square plus i omega into c 1 plus c 2 divided by 1 plus omega square tau 2 square. This is what we worked out earlier. Okay. And this is nothing but 1 over z and uh, and we so this is essentially from this z one can work out what is modulus as well. Modulus is given as this is electric modulus the electric modulus is nothing but m star is nothing but j or i omega c naught into z star. Okay. So, basically it becomes m prime minus i m double prime. The advantage of using this modulus and impedance uh, modulus and impedance spectroscopy together is that mo modulus tend to uh, amplify the contributions of higher frequency lower frequency contributions. But since you can see that i is m star is nothing but i omega z star c naught z star this tends to amplify the contributions at the higher frequency. So, often you will see the semicircles at higher frequency are subdued in the uh, in the impedance spectroscopy, but when you do modulus spectroscopy the, the contributions of high frequency contributions they are more clearly visible in case of modulus. So, they are complementary to each other in the sense that they are not derived from something differently they are all dependent upon each other, but it is just that a different way of representing the two properties. And also um, if you now uh, if I make a table of uh, the complex relationships. So, let us say we make, so if you like because we know that these are related to properties such as impedances, admittances which are complex properties. So, complex properties relationship chart can be made which helps you in analyzing dielectric materials little better. So, let us say on this axis we plot So, here we have z star, here we have y star and we have c star and we have m star right and z again we say z star, y star, c star and m star. So, z star is nothing but z star, this becomes 1 over y star and this is nothing but 1 over i omega c star and this becomes m star divided by i omega c naught. So, z star is equal to 1 over y star, it is equal to 1 over i omega c star which is the complex capacitance and this is m star divided by 
i omega c naught okay so <coughs> now so and all of these properties are uh, so let me just also write how these properties are written as so as, so as as i said earlier sorry z star will be equal to i z z prime plus i z double prime so when you write z prime z prime is z star is equal to z prime plus i z double prime on the other hand m star is m star can also be written as m prime minus i m double prime and then we have c star c star is basically c prime minus i c double prime which is the complex capacitance and admittance is given as y star is equal to y prime plus i y double prime and dielectric constant as we know is epsilon r star is equal to epsilon prime minus i epsilon double prime so this is how these properties are written so and when you write this in the table form so z star will be equal to z z star is will be equal to 1 over y y star it is equal to 1 over i omega c star it will be equal to m star divided by i omega c naught similarly if you write y star it will be 1 over z star this will be equal to nothing but y star this will be i omega c star and this will be i omega c naught divided by m star now if you write for c star it will be 1 over i omega z star this will be y star divided by i omega and this will be c star same as that and this will be c naught divided by m star and when you write for m star this will be m star this will be uh, i omega c naught z star this will be i omega c naught divided by y star and this will be c naught divided by c star okay and if you are wondering uh, what c naught is c naught is nothing but epsilon naught a over d right this is the vacuum capacitance so this is how these complex properties are related to each other generally we use z and m for determination of uh, uh, various components so what might happen for example is you may have a spectra like this you may have spectra which is like this so this is let's say z double prime this is z prime so basically we have two semicircles here one is for high low frequency and one is for high frequency both of them have tau 1 and tau 2 so as a result what will happen is that the time constant for this semicircle belongs to one entity so generally low frequency contributions in solids will come from grain boundaries whereas the high frequency contributions will come from grains so when you plot let us say temperature dependence of these plots so how does the temperature dependence vary so for example if you want to plot z prime as a function of uh, frequency so z prime as a function of frequency might vary something like this as you increase the temperature the, the curve will shift to right so as you increase the temperature the curve will shift to right so temperature increases similarly the peak in the z double prime the z double prime will show correspondingly if you plot z double prime they will show corresponding peaks these peaks will also shift towards right and these peaks correspond to basically omega tau is equal to 1 so what you do is that when you plot 1 over t and we know that tau is equal to tau naught into exponential of minus q a divided by k t so when you plot ln tau we get slopes like these for example so you will get two distinct regions in which you will have one slope and another slope so this is for example at uh, low temperature and this is at high temperature so entity so there is one entity which has certain activation energy at lower frequency there is certain activation at higher uh, so it might happen that you will have so this is for example it could be grain boundary region this could be grain region 
okay. So, these and they, they also have different frequency dependence because the grain the, the, for example, this particular region on the right this may respond at higher frequencies. Whereas, the region that you see on the left which is for grain boundaries it may respond at lower frequencies. So, that that the different type of peak peaks show different behavior in the evolution of Z and M. So, basically for complete analysis you need to look at Z versus Z prime versus F, Z double prime versus F, M prime versus F, M double prime versus F. From these you can determine R and C the resistances and capacitances separately because most of these entities have. So, ideal Debye capacitor looks like this, this is your ideal Debye material, but in reality your material may look like, in reality your material may be modeled like this. and so on and so forth. So, this will this is one RC circuit, this is another RC circuit, so RC 1, RC 2, this could be for grain, this could be for grain boundary and then you have series resistance which is let us say contact resistance RC and so on and so forth. So, reality, so reality may give you different resistances and capacitances. So, when you, so you need there is a and this happens especially in polycrystalline material or materials with lot of defects where resistances and capacitances vary dramatically. As a result you need to separate out the resistive contribution and the uh, capacitive contribution. So, for example, when you see dielectric constant variation as a function of frequency ideally it should be like this, but in most cases you will obtain a behavior which is like this. This decrease of dielectric constant suggests as a function of frequency that you have extrinsic contributions. So, which could be defects for example, which could be vacancies in the system, variety of defects. So, from this from from the blue plot it is easy to measure what the dielectric constant is because dielectric constant is there is a contribution which is frequency independent, but here you have a frequency dependence. So, how do you separate out the real dielectric constant? What is dielectric constant is difficult to tell. So, that is why you need to carry out impedance analysis. Measure Z and theta. From Z and theta you work out what is Z prime, Z double prime, then you work out what is M prime, M double prime, then you work out what is different R's, R1, R2, etcetera, different C1, C2, etcetera. Then looking at the values of R1 and C2 you have to make a judgment. So, generally you will find how do you make a judgment then? So, for example, if you look at uh, if you work out a specific capacitance, specific capacitance is given in farad per meter, okay. So, or farad per centimeter, let us say in this case. So, generally, if the capacitance is of the order of 10 to the minus 12, it is because of bulk. If it is a grain boundary, then it would be of the order of minus 11 to minus 8. So, this would be grain boundary. If it is a surface layer, it would be minus 9 to minus 7 for surface layer. And let us say if you have electrochemical reaction, it may be of the order of minus 4 for electrochemical reaction. So, these values of capacitances will give you an idea about which entity are you talking about, whether are you whether you are talking about bulk or whether you are talking of grain boundaries. So, it is very important to know about what you are doing. So, I will give you certain references that you may go through for impedance spectroscopy. For example, there is a there is a nice paper written by, so th there are there is a group in uh, Sheffield University which has worked extensively on this. So, let me give you the reference. So, this if you look at, so reference for So, you can read this paper by, so this paper advanced, it is in advanced materials journal uh, volume 2 1990 page 
132 this is by uh, authors called as uh, Irvine, Sinclair and A R West. It is a good paper that gives you some idea about the uh, impedance spectroscopy. Then impedance spectroscopy there is a book impedance spectroscopy. by Ross Macdonald. It is a vast topic impedance spectroscopy, I cannot talk about this in this course, but uh, I just wanted to give tell you what you can do. The, the things that you can do is that you can, uh, you can basically look at the microscopic mechanisms behind its capacitances and find out any resistances in the and separate out the resistive and con capacitive contributions, work out the true value of dielectric constant which is purely from uh, the capacitive contributions not from any other anything else uh, by proper modeling by properly modeling the uh, impedance data uh, using these kind of circuits and uh, uh, and this is helped by doing this uh, uh, impedance and modulus spectroscopy and the measurement is basically measurement of impedance and angle z and theta which is done on a impedance analyzer so we will uh, we'll now stop this part of impedance spectroscopy and we will be free now look at uh, finishing this part of linear dielectrics is dielectric breakdown. Okay. And this dielectric breakdown is basically uh, about failure of dielectrics. Okay. So, when you so dielectrics work under a certain electric field, when basically they stop becoming dielectrics that is when uh, dielectric breakdown occurs and generally it is denoted in, in the form of uh, large increase in current or conductivity of dielectric. So, this is what basically dielectric breakdown means. So, essentially if you plot current density as a function of field. So, for very large field the current density will remain low and suddenly at some point the current density will shoot up. So, this is where you will have breakdown and this field is denoted as E B which is the breakdown field. So, essentially this is what we mean by dielectric breakdown. So, in many cases the breakdown may not be sudden, it may be gradual whereas in some cases it may be very uh, rapid. So, if you look at the breakdown the strength of certain materials, so the most important material uh, the, the something that comes across to something that we come across regularly is air, when you see sparking in the air right. So, sparking is basically ionization of air, air has a breakdown field of 3 mega volt per meter which is about 30 kilo volts per centimeter. Okay. And uh, now if you compare certain materials, so le let us say we have materials and then we have E B and we compare this with the, uh, so this is in K V per centimeter. So, if you look for glass, glass has a value of 200 to 400. Okay. If you look at mica, mica has a value of about 200 to 700. Look at polymers, they have a value ranging from 50 to 900. If you look at Al2O3 ceramic, it has a value from 200 to 300. If you look at barium titanate, it has a value of uh, roughly 300 for single crystals. Uh, and silicon carbide that is silicon oxide that is used in ICs it has more than 10,000 kilo volt per centimeter. So, you can see that for most materials the value of breakdown field is significantly larger than the value of uh, breakdown field for air. So, if you now compare so for example, for ele on electric poles sometime you see the sparking and that is mostly because of failure of the capacitor that you have. And the field in the capacitor becomes so high that the air molecules in the vicinity they get ionized. 
also materials contain pores within the pores you have entrapped air and when the field is applied this air gets ionized and sort of it leads to blasting of the material or failure of the material. So, there are various mechanisms because of which this failure occurs. So, the breakdown mechanisms are basically so the first one is intrinsic breakdown. Intrinsic breakdown is basically based on lattice ionization. And what it means is that there is a substantial increase in the electron temperature. Okay. And this is basically a field dependent mechanism. When you apply very high field, the electron temperature rises as a result uh, the material uh, it becomes very conducting. So, field dependent large increases in in conductivity beyond a, a critical field. Okay. Then we have another mechanism which is called as thermal breakdown. Thermal breakdown is basically because of heat dissipation. So, materials have defects and various other uh, reasons which lead to increase in the temperature of the material. Uh, this is basically true for many of the bulk materials which contain defects and they have intrinsic heating and this generally happens at temperatures which is greater than uh, sorry room temperature up to about 3 400 degrees centigrade something like that. And basically uh, uh, it can also be the process can be gradual it can happen at various time scales and it may also be dependent upon the sample geometry. So, um, so this is thermal breakdown and then we have avalanche breakdown. So, essentially this is because of heat dissipation or heat build up okay. and then we have and this is basically uh, because of uh, sudden increase in kinetic energy of electrons leading to large. So, any processes kinetic processes which lead to multiple multiplication in the electron density and electron velocities they lead to large increase in the conductivity. So, sudden avalanche avalanche means there is a deluge of electrons and that leads to a large conductivity. So, this is another one and this generally happens in thin films. Okay. And uh, then you can have other breakdowns such as you can have dielectric discharge. And uh, dielectric discharge could be because of for example, porosity if you have sort of porosity or air entrapped in the air then discharge is created inside the material when you apply field the air gets ionized and which is basically electrical discharge and sort of leads to material ripping apart and then you can also have electrochemical breakdown. Which could be because of uh, uh, because of transport of uh, materials uh, from one place to another within the same material. So, some species may transport to one to another position and another species may transport to another position which leads to changes in the chemistry inside or ionic. Uh, defect chemistry leading to change in the conductivity. So, if you want to read more about uh, uh, breakdowns we can I can refer you to this book principles of electronic ceramics by Henchen West. 
So, this is sort of a sort of a short uh, introduction to linear dielectric materials that I have given to you, uh, basically covering from uh, fundamentals of dielectric materials, the dielectric polarization, dielectric constant, mechanisms of polarization, uh, what kind of polarizabilities that we have, we did some analytical treatment of dielectric polarizabilities of ionic, electronic and dipolar looking at the macroscopic as well as the microscopic scale in terms of frequency dependence and finally, we talked about uh, Debye equations and impedance spectroscopy, how to use impedance spectroscopy, spectroscopy to characterize these materials and finally, about the dielectric breakdown. So, hopefully this has given you a good idea about linear dielectrics, how do you work with them, how do you characterize them and in the next class we will start our discussion on nonlinear and uh, dielectric materials which basically we will talk about some basics of piezoelectric ferroelectric and pyroelectric materials uh, what distinguishes them and uh, individual physics and applications of these materials okay thank you very much